right. Good evening, Refuge family and visitors, I hope and trust. Uh, we tonight are going to feast on the Word of God. We're going to get back into our study in Genesis, so looking forward to that. I, I trust you are as well, and uh, I think we should pray that the Lord uh, would give us ears to hear all that he would speak to us tonight. All right, so if you would join me uh, in prayer, then we'll get to some worship with Michael and Nicole. Oh, Father, thank you, uh, Lord, for the refreshment that comes from your word, the cleansing and the feeding and the nourishment, Lord, and the strengthening and the challenging, Lord. You do that through your word because it's alive, it's powerful, it's sharp, Lord. It does great work. And so, Lord, we don't want to miss out on what you want to do through your word tonight through Pastor Bill. So, Lord, would you help us, Lord, to take that in? Would you give us spiritual ears to hear what you're speaking, Lord, through your word that is alive? And, Father, that it would have uh, its desired effect on our hearts and minds tonight. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Good evening, Wednesday night. So glad that you guys can tune in with us as we worship the Lord. Let's just take this time just to cast our cares upon Jesus. All right, let's worship. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. Hallelujah, louder than the unbelief, I'll raise a hallelujah, my weapon is a melody, I'll raise a hallelujah, heaven comes to fight. Yeah. 
hallelujah. I'll raise a hallelujah. I'll raise a hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
just proclaim your power over our lives, over our families. We say, great are you, Lord, over this pandemic, over our nation, over the world. We say, great are you, Lord. Over the virus, we just say, great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. I pray that you just breathe. Holy Spirit, would you just breathe into us tonight, Lord? Fill us. Would you teach us as we get into your word? We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, real quickly, I um, want to draw your attention, uh, not at this moment, uh, other than to tell you, but don't, you don't need to go there now because I want you to focus in on what we're doing. But on our webpage, under the events section, refugefamily.com slash events. Uh, you may think, well, why events? There's not events going on because we're in lockdown. But that page is where we are providing links and information and all the activities that are going on online uh, through Instagram and a lot of creative ways that our pastoral staff has put together to minister to you uh, and family members and really creative, um, spirit-led, good stuff. So uh, the events page, 
Uh, you can just find it in the drop-down menu list, and I would encourage you to go there, check that out, avail yourself of that blessing. And also, I want to uh, just say uh, I'm so um, blessed to know that many of you now are availing yourself of the food ministry on Monday and Tuesday for the Refuge family, uh, which happens just a one-hour slot, 11 to 12, Monday and Tuesdays. Uh, and this week, that amount of, of folks from Refuge increased, and, and not that we want the need to increase, but we want people that have the need uh, that aren't availing themselves of this to do so, and you have, so that's good, that's good. So keep doing that. The Lord's providing uh, a ton of great food, so um, enjoy it, partake of it. And we're going to partake of the Word of God tonight, so uh, Pastor Bill, take it. Well, hello, all of my friends, and welcome. I think, I think we're using that camera mostly, but welcome to Refuge Online tonight. A lot of churches are saying Refuge at Home tonight. I know there are some churches that have decided they're moving into their building and they're spacing out in their building. And I got to say, I'm not sure that that's wise, but Father, keep those folks safe is, if that's what they're doing tonight, Lord, we ask you for that, but... Um, but here we are, and here's where we have been for, oh my goodness, I think, well, it was while I was in Israel is when you guys started meeting online, and, uh, and here we have been ever since, and uh, we, we made it through the first Easter celebration huddled in the same way that those first Christians were, as they huddled in the upper room, but they were huddled for a different reason. They were huddled for fear. We've been huddled together in our homes and such because that has been the parameters that we've been given. And I know you're all praying, you're all hoping that this will be over soon. We're going to talk about that tonight too. It's just remarkable to me. I don't know if you just kind of get good at seeing segues in almost everything that you find in Scripture from time to time. But this one, no, seriously, there is such a, um, a point of of reference or a parallel point between where the people of Israel found themselves when there was only a clan of about 70 of them and where they found themselves in the middle of a crisis that they certainly hoped would be over soon and it took a lot longer. In fact, it turned into a deeper crisis than they were experiencing when, when the, those 70 came down from the land of Canaan into the land of Egypt like we talked about last week. I had sort of promised, hoped, planned on finishing chapter 47, which we will tonight, but going on into chapter 48, but we're not going to do that. We're not going to rush that. So we're going to be in chapter 48 next week, and it's kind of the continuation, well, not continuation, the culmination of that patriarch when we say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Israel was his other name. It's a culmination of his life as we get closer to that tonight, but certainly not the culmination of the whole story. I'll mention this at the end of our study tonight, but that's that, I almost said silver cord. It's not a silver cord. It's the scarlet thread of redemption that really runs from the Garden of Eden all the way through to the, the cross that we just celebrated a little over a week ago on, on Good Friday. And we're going to see that even show up again tonight in an in unusual measure of grace and, and forgiveness. So I'm excited about getting into that with you tonight. And we're going to sing a song at the end. And uh, it just seemed to me like it went so well with uh, where we are this evening. God, I look to you. Now, I don't know if, uh, if I don't think all of you knew this, but I think some of you did know that, that uh, we have been given um, a real blessing by the people down at, at uh, K-Wave where they're allowing us to, uh, allowing me, I should say, to go in and actually do a uh, live broadcast on Tuesdays. Now, those of you who have been following our study through Matthew, uh, you know that that study has been interrupted on two Tuesdays, but I, I have failed to tell everyone this on the, uh, on the live feed that comes from the studio there in, uh, in Costa Mesa um, at K-Wave, and uh, that you can still get that study. That study is already being broadcast on other stations. They're not getting the live program that I have been doing on, a, on the last two Tuesdays. But they've been getting that, that study in Matthew. And you can go to, the, probably the fastest way to get it is to go to refugefm.com. 
Com. Say that out loud with me, refugefm.com. Turn to the people that are in the room with you and say, go to refugefm.com. And that's where you get the, uh, the study that you will miss on the Tuesdays. We're not going to change that, that prepared broadcast uh, because those who are listening on other stations, they'll, they'll be getting it and you can get it there as well. And by the way, you can go to all of those radio programs that we, or you can go to uh, refugefm.com to get any of the past programs as well. Uh, one of our guys here um, puts that up for you and it's ready. Jim uh, Brubaker has been doing that uh, faithfully for a long, long time. And so I talked with him today just to make sure that's the best place to go. But welcome back to the living room tonight. And uh, I have a, uh, uh, that's, that's what I'm going to call it in, in my heart. I'd love to, for us to put a sign up somewhere that says, come into the living room. And just seeing this as the the, the family room that we gather together in as we, as we come in here on, on Saturdays and Sundays and Tuesdays for the women and other studies in here and, of course, on Saturday, Sunday, Wednesday. But um, welcome to our living room. From our living room here right into your living room or kitchen, wherever you're watching or listening to this. And uh, I want to ask you to continue, please continue, to be praying for your missionaries from here. They're all over the world. You can look up the, the places that they are, at least those that we can give you details on where they are. And uh, next time you're here, you can pick up all the missionary cards, but you, you can find the details on them, and we'll make sure that those are, are readily available. But uh, I want to ask you just to continue to be praying for the missionaries that are serving overseas. I, I just got, a, and I'll mention this because it comes to mind, but I, I just got a, uh, an email today or a text it was, from um, Dave Downs. He and his wife, Danae, serve over in Italy. And there have been some new emission laws in Italy that, ha that made it necessary for them to sell their old diesel car, which I don't know if diesel cars are still as cheap to drive or cheaper to drive than, than petrol cars, as we would say. But they've had to sell that, so when the COVID pale lifts from there, they have to buy a new car, and they've located one. He told me it's a, about 11,000, I think 11,000 euros, which is, uh, in American money, is just a little more than 11,000 U.S. dollars. But they're very thankful that the Lord has led them to the right car, and if anybody would like to help them purchase that for their ministry and, and travel around in their area, you can get a hold of us and we'll tell you how to do that. But thank you again for your, your financial faithfulness and the, it's been such a blessing to see God continue to provide for us here. And know this, as Alan said, we, and we say this to you every day, we are praying for you and we miss you to watch the guys that come up and do the, the, um, the fireside chats, it's, it's like, oh, sometimes I think they're on the verge of tears when they say how much they miss the fellowship, the face-to-face -face fellowship that we have with, uh, with one another. We were talking today on a, uh, a Zoom meeting with all of our pastors because they're working from home now. They come in and, in and out of here. But uh, we, we were talking about the, the, the time in history when in so many different places Christians were forced to not gather, in fact, not allowed to gather. It was against the law, and I mentioned that on our, on our weekend um, a study as well on Easter. But they were forbidden to gather, but they gathered anyway. I'm not suggesting you break the, the quarantine in that, but they had to meet in small groups. I remember hearing about churches that would take hours, literally, not just an hour, but hours for a home group to come together so nobody suspected what all those people were doing, turning the same corner, going down the same alley. And then once they were in that home, they didn't broadcast on PAs. They spoke quietly, quietly, so that uh, they wouldn't be detected by neighbors. And when they went to sing, oh my goodness, this, this gets me. When they would go to sing, because they, they would, would sing in those gatherings, they would all like bring a pillow or some folded up cloth and they would get down on their knees and bury their face in that pillow and they would sing so nobody but God could hear them. And, and, and here we are, you know, in, uh, in our restricted area. <laughs> but I just wonder, you know, and here's several questions we don't have time to go into tonight. Can, but can they see us here? Do they know what's going on down here? I think they got better things to do in heaven 
than, than watch what's happening down here. But if they could see what's going on, I, I could just imagine some of them saying, hey, welcome to our world. That's all we ever knew was worship and, and faithfulness and evangelism and walking out our faith in God when it was in times where it was forbidden. And so we give thanks that that's not what we're under right now, but there still are some. And I want to pray for them before we jump into our study this evening. And so, Father, I just, again, I am so grateful that we are a part of the family of God that gathers around the world. And many of them still tonight, Father, they, they can't publish their meeting times. They can't put the banner out in front of, uh, of a home and, and say, follow us online, Lord. They're, they're restricted and they're careful about that, but they're, they're vibrant in their faith. And Father, would you bless the persecuted church tonight? We're not persecuted, Lord. We're just, we're just restricted. But would you bless the persecuted church this evening? Wherever they find themselves, Father, whatever the pressure is against them, Lord, in these difficult times, some we know that tonight, Lord, they're literally in chains. Some of them are in prisons, in places like China, in places like North Korea, in, in, in different places throughout Africa and, and Asia, Lord. And they're persecuted. God, would you encourage them tonight? And please keep them on our hearts. Would you remind us of them, Father? Father, I believe that even tonight you're probably going to wake up somebody in the middle of the night and it might just be what they think their body is doing, telling them to wake up. But Lord, it's you. And would you put people on our hearts in the middle of our night, which might be the middle of their day. And so we pray for your church to be strong and healthy, Lord. And would you purge us, your church in America, in this time and make something ever so much more beautiful out of us than you have already. We love you, Lord, our God. I pray that you bless us as we jump into your word now. May it jump alive in us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Maybe some night, uh, and next week, uh, Pastor Jonathan is going to come and talk to us about our missionaries, and maybe some night we're just going to have a, a time of scattered prayer. Your home and our home, your living, living room and this living room where we just pray for your needs and the needs of the church around the world. But tonight we are in Genesis chapter 47. I'm clicking this. I'm not sure if it's, it's showing up on the screen. I'll let the screen catch up to me. But I gave this chapter the, the title, When a Crisis Goes from Bad to Worse. And that certainly is what's happened in chapter 47. There are some best case scenarios that sink in midstream. You, we think we've got it all figured out and all the days from this point on are going to be wonderful and rosy, but many times the crisis goes from bad to worse. I want to ask you if you've ever heard of this name. Put this guy up on the screen there if you would. His, his name is Nicolo de Bernardo. Do you, do you recognize that name? He's not too well known by his first two names, but the extension of his name is this, Niccolo di Bernardo de Machiavelli. And Machiavelli had a number of uh, amazing quotes. He, many of you know more than I do about him. He was born in 1469, died in 1527. He was an Italian diplomat during the Renaissance, or Renaissance, however you'd like to pronounce that. And he's been called the father of political philosophy and also the father of political science. He wasn't altogether a nice guy. He was a ruthless um, politician and a ruthless voice in, in many, many ways. But listen to some of his quotes. First one here. And I, I think I, I don't want to go past to put it back up for me if you would. And I don't need to see myself up there on that screen. Just a little inside shop talk here. But he said this. It's not the titles that honor men, but men that honor titles. I love that. Where we almost want to bow before somebody who has a, has a high name. That's why I don't like the term reverend. So he said that. Listen to this next one. He said, everyone sees what you appear to be. Few really know what you are. Uh, man, that, that kind of makes me shudder a little bit. Everybody thinks you're something because, oh, that's Pastor Bill. But very few people know who you really are and even the things and the, the, the challenges that any of us wrestle with. This next one says, it's not, uh, not, I've already done that one. This next one is, I'm not interested in preserving the status quo. 
I want to, hear this is what he said, I want to overthrow the status quo. Well, in every revolution, that's exactly what's happened. And I wouldn't mind seeing some of our status quo overthrown as we come to a new quo or a new status or a new place in the Lord. This one. It, I don't know if you knew that he did this. And there's some discussion on whether or not he, this really originated with him. But apparently he said that it is the end that justifies the means. I don't always agree with that. But this one. This kind of relates to where we are tonight. He said, wars begin where you choose, but they do not end where you please. And that's true. Sometimes the crisis that maybe many of us even tonight are facing, it, we might have decided when that crisis began. And we don't always get to decide when that crisis is over. Pandemics and endemics and Middle Eastern droughts and famines don't end when we choose. I wonder if the children of Israel following Jacob now down to, they were the children of Jacob, Israel, his other name. But as they followed him down to Egypt, I really wonder how long they thought they would be there. Well, they turned out to be there a whole lot longer than they thought they would. So we're going to get back to our story tonight. In Genesis chapter 46, when Jacob came to Egypt, that was a place that God had forbidden him to enter years before. And so you remember last week he hesitated before he took that last trip down into Egypt. He hesitated and made an offering, a sacrifice to God, built an altar and said, God, do I go? And I don't think we have all of the, the conversation or the verbiage between Jacob and Yahweh recorded there. <clears throat> but before he went, he stopped, he paused, and he prayed, and then God told him, you go, because that is where the, the birth of this nation will truly happen. They were a clan, they were a tribe, at that, at that point when the 70 of them arrived in Egypt. But that's where in Egypt, not knowing it would be years of, of bondage and then 40 years of travel through the wilderness, but God said to him, that's where I will make of you a great nation. And do you remember the, the promise that God had spoken to Abraham, repeated it to Isaac? Jacob knew it very well. All of his children did. And the promise was, I will bless you I will make you great. And then God said this, and I will make you a blessing to all the nations of the earth, to the whole earth. One of the nations, one of the very first nations that they blessed. Now, you might say some of the tribal kingdoms, or, or uh, what's the right word? Uh, not pifedoms, whatever it was. Uh, you know, some of the, the smaller clans were blessed by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as they moved through. Sometimes not so blessed. But they had blessed some smaller ones, but now they were going to bless the nearby great empire of the world at that point, which was Egypt. So the place that God had forbidden them was a place that they would become a true nation, hidden away, protected, you're going to see, under favored nation status, and, and at least until a new king would arrive. And you read about that in Exodus chapter 1 in verse 8, but we're a long way from that. So this has been... One of those most, I think, the most dramatic and emotional scenarios in the Bible, the storyline, injustice. You know, a pack of brothers growing up bigger than the Brady Bunch. And there's conflict and there's trouble between them. And so there's injustice and then there's this family division and there's these warring brothers and it's just the, the, the elements of the plot are just set up for some great writer to, to write off of the reality of what happened here where an innocent man is being sold to the highest bidder. Of course, nothing like that in the Bible until Holy Thursday, what we call Maundy Thursday, Holy Thursday, when the Son of God was sold for a handful of coins. And maybe Joseph in that sense was a precursor or a, a, a sort of a, a, an image of, of Jesus, Yeshua from Nazareth, who would be sold into, into captivity for a very short time in, in bondage and then sacrificed for us. A powerful story. But here Jacob discovers last week, that his son Joseph is alive and he can't believe. Do you remember that scene? It took his breath away. He felt like he could fall down, faint under, is this, is this real? And now he finally has seen that favored son Joseph. And, and I had this thought, I wondered, I, I don't know if I mentioned it last week, 
But I wondered when, when Jacob came down to Egypt and he saw his son, I, I, can just, I can just sort of picture this happening, that at some point when he sees that it's him, does he go back to one of the donkeys that, that pulled the carts down there and reach inside of a, of a pack and pull out the remnant of a 22-year-old multicolored coat, a coat of many colors that now has another color embedded into it, soaked into it, the blood of some animal. Did he keep the remnant of his favorite son's coat and have it in his hands when he met his son? Uh, maybe I'm putting too much drama over it, maybe more than I should. But if I wrote the script, I would have had it written like that. I would have had him walk back and pull it out from underneath one of those saddlebags. But the boys are all back together now, and Dad is there, and it, and it should have been, and they hoped it was, a short stay. How short? Well, they probably hoped it would just be until the famine was over, and they'd make their way back up into Canaan. They'd say a big thank you to Mr. Pharaoh and all of his pharaohness. And, and his, his blessing upon them and they would bid them farewell and they'd shake hands in an old-fashioned way and said, let there be a pact between us forever. Well, it didn't end that way. They ended up there a long, long time. They thought they'd be there just till the famine was over and the rains began, but now it's, it looks, it's looking like it's going to last for a while and it does. Now it's time for the father Jacob to meet the father of Egypt. It's time for the boys and their father to be introduced to the Pharaoh. Follow along with me as I read to you from verses 1 through 10. Let's make our way through this powerful, wonderful chapter tonight. Chapter 47. Here we go. And now Joseph, then Joseph went and told Pharaoh and said, my father and my brothers and their flocks and their herds and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan. Indeed, they are in the land of Goshen. And he took five men from among his brothers. I wonder which five he took to be with him as they came and introduced the family to him in, in the form of these four brothers and dad who isn't going to meet them at the, meet Pharaoh at the same time that the father does. So he took five men from among them, his brothers, and presented them to Pharaoh. Now listen to this very quick, you could say, terse interview between them. Pharaoh said to his brothers, what's your occupation? Do you remember last week that um, Joseph told them, now just be honest about who you are. I wonder if under his breath, it's, you know, Joseph could be heard saying, I know that's kind of hard for guys like you to be honest, to be men of honor. But he said, just be honest and, and tell them what your occupation is and that you've done nothing but this all of your life. So Pharaoh said, so what is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, well, your servants, don't you love the way maybe a little bit of buttering up? No, I think it's just honesty. I think it's honoring the head of state that they find themselves before. And they said, well, your servants were shepherds, both we and also our fathers, all the way back. Their fathers, yes, all the way back to Abraham and even before. And they said to Pharaoh, we have come to dwell in the land because your servants have no pasture for their flocks. For the famine, what famine? The same famine Egypt was experiencing. For the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. And now therefore, please, let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Now look at that. That's the only conversation they have face-to-face -face with Pharaoh himself, Pharaoh addressing the boys. The only, the only question is to them, what do you do for a living? They, they, he knows where they're from. He knows who they're related to. We don't know how much of the, the story of the sale of Joseph Pharaoh knows, but I'm assuming he knows more than he's letting on here. He just says, so what's your occupation? And they say, well, all we've ever been. And please let us stay. Please let us stay here. Why? Because there's food down here. And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, not to the five brothers, but to Joseph, your father and your brothers have come to you. I love this. And the land of Egypt is before you. In other words, take your pick. Where do you want to live? The land of Egypt is before you. Have your father and brothers dwell in the best of the land. 
and let them dwell in the land of Goshen. That's where they want to be. Let them stay in the land of Goshen. And if you know any competent men among them, then make them chief herdsmen over my livestock. I love this. He's saying to Joseph, his governor, he says, you know, let them have Goshen. It's the best of the land. Let them go ahead and settle there, and I could use a few good herdsmen for my herds. Maybe my herds and my flock, my herds and, and all of my livestock. He said, if they're good with animals, I've got jobs for them. And then Joseph brought in his father. Oh, here's where it gets really good. And, and this conversation is equally as short. Listen, he brings in his father and he set him before Pharaoh and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Exactly like God said Abraham's family would. You'll be a blessing to other nations, which of course and to their leaders. And he's doing what he was commissioned to do by God as the head of this family, passing on a blessing to the, the head of state of the land of Egypt. And he blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh looks at Jacob. I'm, I'm sure he kind of looked him up and down and he realized, whoa, this is one old guy. And his question, I have to believe that he kind of asked it like this. Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you, dude? Well, in whatever Egyptian form of the word dude it is, it had to be in there somewhere. Brother, how old are you? Well, here's how old he is. We don't have to guess. Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers. Abraham, you know how old he lived to be. And, Jake, or, and Isaac, he said, the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. And so Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. The only question up to this point that Pharaoh has for Jacob, whose other name is Israel, of course. And the only, the only question is, Bro, how old are you? And he finds out how old he is, which in, in so many words is God's way of saying, oh my goodness, you have been kept. God has a way of pickling his chosen, and he has certainly preserved you to be this old. He's not done yet. He's going to live for a little while longer. And, and so it's over. The interview between the two of them, Jacob blesses Pharaoh, and then he goes out. Thank you, Josh. Thank you so much. Let's hear it for Josh. Thank you, Josh. Ooh. You just blessed everybody hearing me, so I won't cough anymore, brother. And then verses 11 and 12. I love what happens next here. Because Joseph is not done blessing his family. He's not done blessing his brothers. And do I need to uh, say it again? These brothers who don't deserve a blessing, but really in reality none of us do, but they don't deserve a blessing, especially from Joseph. Anybody would have understood if Joseph said, hey, hey, boys, and starting from the oldest on down, Reuben and then Simeon and all of them all the way down, he could have said to them, except you, Benjamin, you guys, you get nothing. You get nothing. Go back home. You get no grain. You get nothing. But he didn't. Look at verses 11 and 12, how Joseph grows in grace. What a reflection of God here. It says, and Joseph situated his father and his brothers, and he gave them a possession in the land of Egypt. A possession. He gave them property. He gave them real estate holdings. It wasn't just, you, you can go live there. He said, this is yours now. You had nothing back in, in, in Canaan, really. But this is yours now. This is your possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And then Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with bread, according to the number of of their family. In other words, he gave them everything they needed. For, now, now back up. Think about this relationship. First, he forgave them. I guess first he, he longed for them. And when he saw them, this, this rescue began. 
He'd set his heart to help them, but he did work them for a while, as we talked about the, the drama that he put them through. But first he forgives them. He clears their debt to him, and they were deeply in debt to him. And he did it without exacting any justice. Do you do that? Do I do that? I wonder how many of us are, are likely to say, well, dude, I forgive you, but don't come around here anymore. I forgive you, and we put a limitation on our forgiveness and our grace to somebody. Why? Well, because that's expected. God doesn't expect us to be like him, does he? Well, you know the truth. He actually does. You know, and here's Joseph doing this, and Joseph has never read Matthew chapter 16, verses 14 to 15 where it says, if you don't forgive men their trespasses against you, then your heavenly Father won't forgive you your trespasses. And that is meant to, to shock us. I think that's meant to, to uh, alarm us and to lead us to being people of grace, like, like Joseph in this case. And he, maybe he had never read Matthew 6, 14 through 15, but what he did have is he had a relationship with the same Abba, that Jesus, Yeshua, had a relationship with. And somehow he had tempered his heart. And somehow he had taught him to show grace when grace wasn't expected, when vengeance would have been expected and accepted. And Joseph, he did more than that. Without ex exacting justice, he forgave them. And then Joseph literally saved them. He, he told them so much. He said, you guys, you guys did what you did to me for evil, but God's the one who sent me here so I could save you. So he forgives them and literally he saves their life. They would have been victims of the, of the famine, of, of the, the crisis of their day, like COVID is the crisis of our day. They would have been victims of, of that terrible crisis. And so he forgives them, he saves them, and now I love the word that's used in my Bible, he situates them. He, he puts him in a wonderful situation at Pharaoh's insistence. Do you remember that back in, in chapter 45? I, I want to read this to you. I, I think I mentioned it again last week. But in chapter 55 in verse 18, this is when Pharaoh is just so excited to hear that uh, Joseph's family is alive and they're coming and they've sent for the father. And so the Pharaoh is saying this. He said, bring your father and your households and come to me and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt. And you will eat the fat of the land, so the best of the land, the fat of the land. And now you're commanded, do this, take carts out of the land of Egypt for your little ones, this is being said to the brothers, and your wives, and bring your father, and, in verse 20, and, and, and don't be concerned about your goods, for the best of the land of Egypt is yours. He told them, bring, bring everything that you want to bring, but you can leave your stuff, because our stuff here is better. And so they, they've come down at the expense and the insistence of Pharaoh, and they've got the best possession of real estate, and Pharaoh included the best of Egypt as he told them, leave your other stuff behind. And again, can I say it? Things are looking good for the nation of Israel at this early point of their existence. Very, very good. They've really only been around as a nation. I, you know, I should have done the math on this. Maybe a couple of hundred years, but there's 400 years ahead of them that they'll be slaves in Egypt. But the crisis continues. Things are looking good, but sometimes the crisis lasts a whole lot longer than we wish it would. Look down at verse 13 and follow along with me. It says, now there was no bread. I thought, I, I thought the bad days were over. No, there's still a famine. Now there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. Wait, there's still a famine? Well, well God, I thought you were lifting this thing. I thought you were solving the problem in all of the details. Well, it doesn't happen that way usually. Why is there no, there's no bread in Canaan? There's no bread in, uh, in the land of Egypt? I, I thought there was. Well, there was, and you'll see this in a moment. But the bread and the grain to make the bread 
is under the authority of the state. All of it is under the authority of the state. And whatever people kept back for their own, because remember there was a percentage of whatever came off of their fields was to be brought into the granaries that, um, that, that uh, Joseph had overseen the building of. So all of that had come, and there was still enough to feed people. But here's what you're going to find out in the rest of this chapter. It wasn't for free. It wasn't just doled out and handed out in $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 checks signed by the Pharaoh. You had to pay for it. Well, you can see the crisis that's coming. So, yes, there was no grain in anybody's fields anywhere, but the grain was in the granaries. And even in Egypt, in the land out there, everybody ran out. That's the people that ran out of, of bread. But Pharaoh still had bread, as I said, for sale. Why did he have bread? Was it a miracle? No, it was not a miracle. It was a, a case of Joseph's, as we studied earlier, Joseph's wise management of the crisis. He put his heart to this. God had, had vision that he gave him. I believe it was, was inspi uh, an inspired management scheme that was given to Joseph, and it was faithfully instituted by Joseph. Those who have gifts of administration and gifts of, of management, like Pastor Allen that you guys know so well here as, as one of our pastors with a very strong pastoral gift and heart as well and a great teacher, has a wonderful gift of administration. He's a Joseph in that sense. So, But it wasn't a miracle. It was just a case of Joseph's wise management. I want you to see this. I'm going to put it up on your screen. This was not written by any smart guy. These are just thoughts that rambled or rumbled out of my head earlier this afternoon when I was thinking through this. And I want you to see this. And, uh, I'll just read it out loud to you. But believers have always had to live through the same storms, the same wars, the same plagues and famines, epidemics, pandemics, blackouts, earthquakes, floods, wildfires, political nonsense everywhere that everyone else has had to live through. Believers don't get a, a pass when it comes to hardship on, an, on a local, national, or international scale. When meteorites hit, when, when we have natural catastrophes, when there's earthquakes like I just wrote about, when there's floods, believers die in those as, as well as those who want nothing whatsoever to do with God. So then what's the difference for the believer? Look at the next slide here with me. The difference is this. The difference has always been how the true believers have responded in those tough times with faith and love and hope. I, I, uh, f and I'm sorry, faith, hope, joy, and love for God and those around them. And you could add the rest of the fruit of the Spirit. Patience, long-suffering, goodness and kindness and self-control. We go through the same stuff. And the difference has always been the way that we respond if we respond that way in tough times. When the believer dials himself down to just respond with the same panic, with the same greed, with the same, oh, well, I'll get mine and hope you get some too, then we're really no different than the world. But the difference between us is how we respond, and you can certainly see that in the life of Joseph. Well, in chapter 47, verse 14 through 26, it's, um, it's the case of a, a tough leader making tough decisions in tough times, and I want you to follow along with me in this, and we'll make our way towards the end of this before long tonight. And I meant to mention this at the beginning of our study. The, the high schoolers are going to have an online Zoom meeting with Pastor David tonight. So I'm going to try to end a little bit earlier so they have more time to hang out. God's doing a great work among our young people in these tough times. And I'm, I'm so excited, so proud of these young people. Verse 14, down to verse 26. And we'll make our, our way through this slowly. Joseph gathered up all the money. He gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt, in the land of Canaan, for the grain which they bought. 
And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. In other words, people were broken. You know, it's not the idea that Joseph sent out his soldiers and said, go get the rest of the money. No, people had already used what last money they had to buy more grain. And what they gave, Joseph didn't pilfer any of it. He took it right to where it belonged in the treasury. And by the way, that's why I had this, this next uh, slide up there. I th think I got some things out of order. This was the name that was given to Joseph by Pharaoh back in chapter 41, verse 45. The name, if I'm pronouncing it right, and I may not be, Zaphnath Panea. Zaphnath Panea. And it literally meant in the, in the um, Egyptian tongue, treasury of the glorious rest. And apparently, Pharaoh said, you are so good at what you do, Joseph. You have really become like the storehouse for us. You've built storehouses, but your storehouse of wisdom and, and, and the, the wise plan that you put together, you got a new name, young man, and your name from now on is, is going to be the, the treasury of the glorious rest. You're the one that's given us peace in our land. And so in, in verse 14, it tells us that Joseph had managed that treasury. He took care of it and made sure that there, there would be some funds and there would be resources. Wait till you see how well off the state becomes in this crisis. In verse 15, it says, the people, they came to the governor and says, so when the money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, and all the Egyptians came to Joseph. Why? Because he was their governor. And he said, give us bread, for why should we die in your presence? Because the money has failed. There's a, an, an old song that uh, some of you know the name Larry Norman wrote, uh, and, and it's still is sung. It's one of those, those songs from the Jesus movement that still kind of has some life in it today. Every now and then you hear it on K-Wave or other, uh, other music, uh, Christian music stations, but it was... Uh, um, life was full of guns and war, and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. And a piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. You'd give up a bag of money just to get a loaf of bread. I wonder if, if uh, Larry Norman got that idea out of this passage. So they come running to, to Joseph, and they say, what, what good was our money? Our money is gone. Please give us bread. Why should we die right here in your presence, the money's failed means we're, we're flat broke. We have nothing. And then Joseph, this is going to be a little bit hard for some of you to hear and to wrap your head around that it seems like he's really taken advantage of the people. But I want to caution you, wait for your judgment until you hear the people at the end of the story and what they say. It says in verse 16 and 17, then, then Joseph said, well, give your livestock and I will give you bread for your livestock if the money is gone. And so they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the cattle of the herds, and even for the donkeys. And then he fed them with bread in exchange for all their livestock that year. He gave them enough food from what they, and you would have to assume that Joseph being a fair man, he gave them a fair amount of grain for whatever the, the, the price, or the, the, I guess you'd say the market price of those animals. And he said, look, I can't just give it away to you, but what do you have? You have some livestock. Bring me the livestock, and you'll have food, and you will live. And it worked. It worked for the year. And, and then it says, so he fed them with bread in exchange for all their livestock that year. Well, the crisis is still not over. This was deep. Verse 18 through 19. And when that year had ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, we will not hide from the Lord that our money is gone. In other words, you already know this. If, you, if you've forgotten it from last year, here we are again, same faces, a little thinner now. But you, you know that our money is gone. My Lord also has our herds of livestock. There's nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our, our lands. Well, let me ask you, what condition were the lands in? parched and broken. Uh, Joy and I and our family lived out in the desert for years, uh, about 19 years out in, in the Coachella Valley here near Palm Springs and Desert Hot Springs. And I remember what the desert looked like 
after the rains, and there would be every year, you know, decent rain and sometimes massive rain, and you could not drive back and forth from Desert Hot Springs into work in Palm Springs because the roads were just washed over or washed out. And every year somebody tried, and many times that was me, and got stuck in the flooded water. Thank God, I remember this one time, some guy came along behind me in a great big four by four truck and pushed me through the flood I should not have gotten into. Just saved myself 30 minutes driving around it and, and in, in saving, I got in a lot of trouble. But I remember after the, the rain was gone and then those long summer months came, you would go down to what used to be just smooth, sandy desert, and you'd watch it begin to break up into chunks. And it would dry out in these little clumps with little, little valleys between them everywhere. That's what that land would have looked like in those days. He said, all we've got left is our bodies and our wretched land that's as dried up as any of the rest of the land in Egypt. And he said, why, verse 19, why should we die before your eyes both we and our land, buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants of Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. That's maybe in hopes that the rains were coming again. And, and so the crisis, it continues. The people are desperate, and they just make their plea. Here we are again. You were so good to us last time, Joseph. Is there anything you can do for us if we make ourselves your servants. That's all we've got left to, to barter. All of our animals are gone. You've got all our money already. And they weren't faulting him for selling them the grain and, and for selling them their animals. And they're saying, you've been fair. Would you let us serve? Would you let us become your servants and you can have our real estate? What good is it to us if we die? And then the government... <laughs> buys all the land. It sounds like, yes, it sounds like communism, sounds like socialism. They're taking everything. The holdings of all the real estate will now belong to the state. Verse 20, and then it says, then, then Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every man of the Egyptians sold his field because the famine was severe upon the land. So the land became Pharaoh's. And as for the people, he moved them into the cities from one end of the borders of Egypt to the other end. And only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had rations allotted to them by Pharaoh, and they ate their rations, which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell, you could say, did not need to sell their lands. And then Joseph said to the people, Indeed, I have bought you and your lands this day for Pharaoh. Look, here is seed for you. And you shall sow the land, and it, it shall come to pass in the harvest that you shall give one fifth of your land. Not, not a tithe, you know, the, the, the tithe in the Old Testament. By the way, it was more than, than just a tenth. The first percentage of what you gave was the tenth, but then there were other percentages that you were to give, and you can, we can re study about that another time, but it would go close to a double and a half, some would say a triple amount, 30% of, of your income would go somehow into the state and into the work of the Lord and the, and the upkeep on the, the temple and keeping the services and all that going. And so, you know, we, if Christians say, do we really need to tithe? Is the tithe a New Testament principle? Well, of course it is. You know, Jesus underlined it. He underscored it. He, when he talked to those, uh, those guys that were com complaining about this or that, and he says, you guys, you tithe off of your mint and your rue, your little herb gardens in the back, and he said, and you should. Jesus didn't pull the plug on the tithe, but it's not like a legal thing that God's going to get you if you don't tithe. I think the tithe is the starting point for any believer. Then you just say, God, whatever else I can, can use to serve you and to bless people and to help the hurting than you give out of free will. And I'm not saying that we're passing the basket three times. I'm saying that that's you and I giving into the service of God as we help the needy wherever you find them. So anyway, I'm, I'm getting a little off, the, off base here. But to the Egyptians, it was, it was a fifth that they were to give. So 20%, four-fifths shall be your own as seed for the field and for your food, for those of your households, and as food for your little ones. Now listen to the people. 
as they speak back to Joseph. None of them said, oh, that's a little harsh there, Joseph. That's tough. And Joseph said, look, when the crops come in, a fifth of it comes back here. So we, we can provide and we can help more people. And, and the, the, uh, the religious leaders were taken care of through that as well from Pharaoh. And so they said to him, you have saved our lives. And let us find favor in the sight of my Lord. And we will be Pharaoh's servants. And so Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt to this day, that day that would be, that Pharaoh should have one-fifth except for the land of the priests only, which did not become Pharaoh's. So the government buys all the land. Okay, we see that. But I want you to remember something. I, I think I've got this marked. I want you to remember Psalm 24 in this context. You know, th this is not a statement against personal ownership of, of property. You know, what the bank owns ours. <laughs> We're working on getting it back from the bank. But listen to what the scripture says about everything. David said it in Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's. All the real estate belongs to God, ultimately. The earth is the Lord's and all of its fullness. I think that would be a reference to the crops and everything that grows on it. And then, but he's not done. And the world is the Lord's. And those who dwell therein belong to God. Everything is God's. What, what kind of a God? A good God. A faithful God. A God who provides. A God who protects. A God who walks with us through our trials. The earth is the Lord's, all that's on it, and all those who in it, the world and all those who dwell in it, for he founded it upon the seas, and he established it upon the waters. That, that's an important thing to remember, that everything belongs to God. All of us who own land, I, trust me, it's a temporary setup. I don't know that we're going to be doled out little, you know, property deeds in the new Jerusalem or, or in the new, the new earth and the new heaven. I think he, then it, it again, it all belongs to God and his family. Oh, yeah, and we are his family. But state ownership of real estate was common in those days. In the 1700s, in, uh, in, and before the 1700s, in the British Empire, the land belonged to the crown. And you couldn't just even go out on the land that you lived in and hunt rabbits. There were people who were um, handed down the sentence of transportation. It was one of the most dreaded sentences in the history of the British Empire. Transportation means you were stuck on a ship and you were headed, depends on, on what penal colony they were sending you to. Up until 1776, that penal colony was here in the United States. And, and one of the statements that our forefathers made is no more taxation without representation and we're done being a, a, a penal colony. We're done being a prison for England and, um, among other things. But state ownership of the real estate was common and you could suffer transportation by hunting on land that you thought was yours because all of it belonged to the crown. Literally, debt slavery was common in those days. Religious exemption was common in those days for those who, who were employed in calling out to the God of heavens to bless the country. So everything we've just read in that portion of chapter 47 was very, very common. But at the end of the day, here's the deal. At the end of the day, the plan saved nations, not just one nation, it saved Joseph's wise plan given to him by God. It saved the nation of Egypt. And it saved this little band of, I use the term, I'm using this term a lot lately, of ragamuffin travelers and believers in this other God, Yahweh, Jehovah, the sons and daughters of Abraham. It saved that nation when they were, as I said at the beginning, little more than, than just a tribe. It saved Egypt, the empire, and this new kid on the block nation, Israel. The wisdom of God that was put into effect at that time. Now, you know, nation, that nation that was saved is going to be judged by God because of the way they eventually treat the people of Israel. But we're not done with our story here. In verse 27, it's very, very quick. This is a promise between a father and a son. That, I did have that slide, between a, uh, a father and a son. 
Read along with me. It says, So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions there, and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Underline that, overline it, put a note, and there's more to come on that. But they're growing. They're in this fertile land. They're a fertile nation. And it says, And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the length of Jacob's life was 100 and 47 years. Remember he said earlier tonight, we saw him say, I'm 130 years old, my friend, the Pharaoh. Now he's 147. And when the time drew near that Israel must die, that's, again, that's the name for Jacob, he called his son Joseph and he said to him, now imagine this conversation between father and son. He said to Joseph, now if I have found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh. That's either like right here or on the back of the thigh. He said, put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt. He said, I may die here, son, but I don't want to be buried here. He said this, but let me lie with my fathers. You shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you have said, Father. I will do as you have said. And then he said, swear to me. And he swore to him. So Israel bowed himself on the head of the bed. He's not dead yet, but that is just about to happen. We'll have to get there next week. But what a scene at this point. A promise between a father and a son over where he wanted to be buried you can go to that place today. Well, not today <laughs> because you can't fly there. It's in Israel. And even if you were there, you probably couldn't get there today. I have never been there. It's in what is called Hebron today. The, the cave at Machpelah where they, they buried the patriarchs. He said, I want you to take me back to that plot of land, which was the only thing that they owned at that time. Just a burial plot for the patriarchs and the family of Israel. And he said, I want you to make a promise to me, Joe, that when I die, that you'll carry me back there. See, when a family tomb or a family plot was fixed, it, be, it, it became a tradition to take that, the family members there. It, it, it kept the tribe in place. And it, it, it strengthened their right to that plot of ground. It gave them just a toehold in the land. And he said, I want you to take me back there. My family is buried all over the place. And so is Joy, my wife's family. But my brother Kevin, he's buried in Urbana, Ohio. And my grandmother is buried in Cincinnati, Ohio. My grandfather is buried in Urbana, Ohio. My dad is buried in Miamisburg, Ohio, miles away. My mom is buried in Long Beach. And Joy and I have decided that we're not going to be buried. We're going to be raptured. Amen, babe? Amen. You can barely hear that faint amen. She's sitting here tonight as well. But I want to be raptured. I know you want to be raptured too, but some of us won't be. We won't make it to that great upcalling. But until then, whether raptured or whether we, we, we die on this planet, until then we navigate the crisis that we're in tonight. And with this I want to close. This crisis that, that Joseph went through, that crisis defined him. Both the crisis of the, the crime against him by his brothers, human trafficking, and the crisis that he managed in Egypt, which kept at least two nations and other nations probably around them, alive. And sometimes it's the crisis that defines all of us. You're going you're gonna to go through something. You're going to have hard times. And, and whatever that crisis is that you go through, it just might define you as well. In fact, it probably will. People will look back to the way you handled this. I, I was thinking earlier tonight as I was looking all of this over that you, know, you, you think about the challenges that a leader faces and how those challenges determine how that person will be remembered. You, you think about... Abraham Lincoln was defined by how he handled the Civil War and the rights of, of slaves to be free and trying to keep our nation together. FDR, 
be remembered for how he managed during a time of crisis. I, I heard today, earlier, I think it was on K-Wave, somebody mentioning that um, Teddy Roosevelt had, had said something about his disappointment <laughs> that there was never a really big crisis during his day because he realized that people were defined and leaders are often defined by their crisis. And, and um, Ronald Reagan, you remember, some of us remember him saying, when watching this on television, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And he'll be remembered for the strong leadership in his day. And you and I are walking through crisis today, and you will walk through more crisis, no, no question about it, but sometimes the crisis may go from bad to worse. Just like in this case, it, it, it may not be over for a long time. There's no guarantee that we will gather again here by summer. And there's no guarantee that the kids will be back in school by September. And even if they are, we heard some things today about how it's going to be different in the classrooms. But the guarantee is this, that God is with us right now. He's with us in the midst of this crisis. He's with you just like I'm sitting here with you tonight, he is with us. And so I want to ask you, what crisis is it that will define you and me? And it has everything to do with how you and I run to God in the middle of our crisis. So I want us to sing this song tonight as we close. Here as the young people are getting ready, as high schoolers are getting ready to gather together. Let's sing to this. This is exactly what Joseph did. Is exactly what we need to do. God, I look to you and I won't be overwhelmed. Sing this. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision. See things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do, and I will love you, Lord, my strength. I will love you, Lord, my shield, and I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever all my days, I will love you, God. God, I look to you. God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed, I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. Oh God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom to know just what to do, and I will love you. My strength, and I will love you, Lord, my shield. I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever, all my days, I will love you, Lord. We do this a lot these days. I'm going to encourage you to stand up and let's sing this together. I will love you, Lord, my strength. Oh, I will love you, Lord, my strength. Even at home, stand up. And I will love you, Lord, my shield. And I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever, all my days, I will love you, Lord. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Let's sing this out to Him. Strong. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Forever all my days, hallelujah. Hallelujah, our all of this, Lord. Hallelujah, our God. Reign. You reign over COVID-19, Lord. Hallelujah, our God reigns. 
forever all my days hallelujah forever all my days forever all my days hallelujah forever forever all my I will love you I will love you God Father God for all of our days we will love you Lord reign in our hearts as we walk through this crisis just like all of our neighbors are Lord, let there be something different something golden in us Lord gold that you have refined in this fire Father God give us perseverance to make it to the end of it Lord you are so good you are so present and I pray for your peace over my brothers and sisters right now Father God, I pray for those that have been trembling, those who have allowed this crisis to shake them. Hear their prayer even right now, Lord. Hear them, their prayers, they lift it to you. I encourage you, whoever you are, wherever you are right now, that you would just say, God, I'm going to trust you. I won't be overwhelmed because you're not overwhelmed and you're with me in this, Lord. Give him praise, give him praise call out upon your Savior, your Keeper, your best friend, your Lord, your Provider, and be defined by your faith and your hope and your joy and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you, keep you, strengthen you, fire you up, fill you with His Spirit, and send you out to touch as many as you can for Him. Be here tomorrow at noon for the fireside chat and on Friday at noon I forget which camera I'm supposed to look at on Friday at noon you have your grape juice and you have your bread ready and we'll have communion joy and I will serve you that as well peace upon you tonight shalom shalom hold tightly to him God bless you this has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach with Pastor Bill Welsh. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.